So there was a time that um, I was away from church for a while and, and during that time I missed quite an event which wasn't necessarily a good event unfortunately but there was a young man that I knew, he was probably about my age, he seemed like a, a good normal Christian young fella and um, he married a lovely young lady but it turns out that um, I think probably going back about say 10 years ago which um, you know, means he wasn't that young anymore, um, he out of the blue, he, he started a pyramid scheme and nobody knew that it was a pyramid scheme. He just seemed to be very good at investing money and so he offered to invest money for friends, family and church members and um, he was returning excellent um, you know, investment results. There was people who were gaining tens of thousands of dollars out of the investments that he was doing on their behalf. But unfortunately, as it turned out, as more and more people got involved, he was um, returning fewer and fewer and smaller investments to the point where he actually um, was taking, in some cases, hundreds of thousands of dollars off people for various excuses and um, nobody ended up getting their money back. So he spent time in jail and that was for about six million dollars that he managed to make off with. So pyramid schemes don't generally work. However, this morning we're going to have a little bit of a look more again at um, Jesus' command, his new command, love each other as I have loved you. And I'm going to show, try and show that that is the one pyramid scheme that actually does work. So in John chapter 15 verses 1 to 16, Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. <clears throat> I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is my father. This is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. <clears throat> As the father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants, because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends, for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command, love one another. Holy Spirit, we ask that you will come this morning and that you will be our teacher and that you will open up the word this morning that you will transform the word spoken into what your people need to hear in Jesus name amen. amen so why do we need another law last week we noted that there's approximately 600 commands in the Old Testament and that they can be summed up in just two you shall love the Lord with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind that sums up the, the laws on how we are to relate to God. And you shall love your neighbour as yourself, which sums up how we are to relate to each other. So when Jesus said, love each other, did he really give a new commandment at all? 
Well, I'm going to say, yes, he did give a new commandment because he also added, as I have loved you. So he had done something different. He'd given an example. And Jesus demonstrated, he demonstrated love with power and passion that had never been seen before. God never commands us to do anything that he himself has not already done or isn't prepared to do. And this is Good Leadership 101. And our God, well, he's the ultimate in good leaders. In, John, well, in 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, we hear, This is love indeed. We did not love God, but he loved us and sent his Son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It was Jesus himself who took our sins in his own body on the cross. So then what happens to the law? Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 26 tells us, Cursed is he who does not put the words of this law into practice. Now that sounds like a major problem to me because I can't keep the law. If I set out to keep it, I find I've broken it day in and day out. However, there's Jesus. Jesus kept the entire law on your behalf and on my behalf. He satisfied the law's demand and he defanged the law. For those who believe in Jesus, the law no, is no longer a condemnation to us. Jesus set us free from the law by giving us the power to obey it. So Jesus didn't abolish the law, but he gave us the Holy Spirit to empower us to keep the law. And he simplified it into the law of love. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And with that came the power. So that's the difference between all the laws given in the Old Testament and that one law that Jesus gave, that one command that Jesus gave us in the New Testament. And that is the power that came with Jesus' new command to actually obey it. And it turns out that as we learn to love each other as Jesus has loved us, we're actually obeying the whole law because the whole of the law is summed up in loving each other and loving God so that the power to love fulfills the law's demands. So then what did Jesus change for us as individuals? The commandments of the Old Testament governing the way we relate human to human are summed up in the words, you shall love your neighbour as yourself. Now you may as well command a three-year-old child to explain E equals MC squared, Albert Einstein's, Albert Einstein's theory of special relativity. Now, I can't even wrap my head around Albert Einstein's theory of special relativity as an adult. I, I kind of have had a quick look at it a couple of times and it just makes my head spin. So the point is that we can give a command, but without the power to obey, a command is pretty much useless. And Jesus' apostles and disciples make that point pretty clear to us. The command to love each other had always been there from the, right from the Old Testament through and Jesus had uh, continued that command, repeated it, that we are to love each other. But before the apostles and the disciples were baptised in the Holy Spirit, we find from the Gospel records that they were a pretty selfish bunch. And they cared a lot about number one, that is each one cared about himself. We find constantly that they were arguing with each other about who was the greatest or who would be the greatest. We had two of them um, come with their mother to Jesus to ask for the number one and the number two position in Jesus' kingdom when he came into his kingdom. And uh, we, we find that the disciples tried to prevent people from bringing children to Jesus to have them blessed. They probably had good reasons. They might have been tired and just wanted to go home. But nevertheless, they were being selfish like, well, I'm going to say I can be selfish, that's for sure. Those guys had issues just like we have issues. And we find that um, in one place, 
the disciples had found a man casting out demons in the name of Jesus. And because they didn't know him, he didn't go with their group, they tried to forbid him from doing that. So Jesus had to rebuke his disciples and say, he who is not against us is for us. You know, don't stop him. He's doing a good work. So there was a distinct lack of understanding of that principle of love one another before they were given the, the Holy Spirit. However, Jesus had told in um, the Gospels there that the, um, the Holy Spirit, when he came, would give them power, power from on high, and that is exactly what they received in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. These guys changed. They changed radically. These guys risked their lives time and again to take the gospel of the love of Christ Jesus to everyone in Israel and throughout the known world. And it was risky because the Jewish leaders hated the gospel of Christ Jesus. They hated Jesus and they hated his followers. In fact, when they had opportunity, they would kill Jesus' followers. And the Roman government became increasingly uh, hostile to Christianity and would persecute Christians and began under several um, of the emperors, Nero included, to kill Christians when they um, were found. So we found that these apostles, most of them, I think it might have been the apostle John who uh, lived to a ripe old age, most of the other apostles were martyred for their faith. They were martyred because they knew that sharing the love of Jesus with lost sinners was far greater. They did not fear the consequences of what men could do to them. So the apostles went from infighting over who was going to be the greatest to being men with an unstoppable, unstoppable and a unified mission to establish the church of our Lord Jesus Christ and to ensure that the, the gospel of Jesus was preached to every man, woman and child. And we find absolutely no other references in scripture to those guys um, fighting among each other as to who was going to be the greatest. There was power that they received to obey Jesus' command to love one another. Power of the Holy Spirit. And you and I have that same power available to us. So yes, what about us? Well, when we start to wrap our heads around Jesus' command to love one another as I have loved you, it transforms us in the same way that the, um, the apostles and the disciples of the early church were transformed. Now, loving each other isn't always that easy. We've got differences, we've got different personalities. And so um, the, the, the thing that has really made a difference for me, I was um, given this advice by a pastor a few years ago, in fact, he told everybody, pray for one another. When we pray for each other, we begin to love those people. And when I say pray for each other, that is we pray God's blessing on each other. <clears throat> we thank God for each other. Now, particularly for those people that uh, we struggle with, we ask God to bless them and to pour out his Holy Spirit upon them and to uh, bless their family, bless their finances, bless their home, bless their employment, bless their job, bless them with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. We don't go praying our own will on other people. We don't go bringing um, what we perceive as their faults to God because God knows far better than we do what their faults are, what my faults are. God knows how to change human hearts. And so we just pray blessing on people and God changes us, God changes the other person until we find that we are gaining a heart of love for those around us. And that process <clears throat> can work not just for the people in this room and the people in our own families, but for people of other churches and other denominations. We don't actually have to um, pray God bless the things that we don't agree with that uh, other people in other churches might be doing, but we ask God to just bless them as individuals um, pour out his Holy Spirit upon them, empower them to be Christ Jesus' witnesses in the community. And we thank God for the good things that we can see those guys doing. Because once again, 
it's the Holy Spirit who does a fantastic job of, of changing our hearts and changing their hearts. And Christ Jesus has already told us that um, you know, there will be one flock and one shepherd. Christ Jesus himself is the shepherd. And we, we're not just individual flocks, we're, we're individual fellowships, but there's supposed to be one flock. We're supposed to see each other as one with the whole of the body of Christ. <clears throat> and so when we start to learn to love each other, there is a power that is released upon the church and to influence the community around us that has not been that isn't seen when we're all competing one against another or fellowship against fellowship there's there's power that can come no other way Yes, it was Jesus said in John 10, 16, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there will be one flock and one shepherd. So we are supposed to be one, one with each other throughout the, uh, throughout the church of our Lord Jesus Christ because Jesus died for each and every one of us, for you, for me, for the people in the Anglican Church, the Catholic Church, Uniting Church, whatever other churches we've got in this area, Christ Jesus died for them just as he died for you and for me. And they are precious, precious to Jesus. So we just, um, we ask the Lord Jesus Christ to make us one with all the believers and to give us hearts of love one for another. See, there was a, um, I might have mentioned before, but there was a, a particular bloke back in Rockhampton who, um, he was, he was an, in hindsight, an amazing man. I hope he's still alive. But nevertheless, I didn't like him because I didn't like the way he looked. I didn't like the image that he had. I didn't like the way he spoke. And, um, you know, the, he was from a different denomination. And um, even though I'd never attended that church, I didn't think I liked their views. So this, this man would sit out in the uh, street in public places with a table and tracts and he would witness to anybody who would um, come past, anybody who wanted to stop. He'd take random people for a coffee and um, sit and chat and I, I didn't like him. I, I thought that this was a bad view of people that people were getting of what it was to be a Christian. And then one day out of the blue, the Holy Spirit just <coughs> convicted me and I realised that I was despising one of God's children. And this man, he was actually following the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel, starting in his own town, while, while I was sneering at him. And I, I realized that this was a terrible attitude that I was holding towards this man. And so the, the Holy Spirit transformed my heart and I began to love that man and to admire what he was actually doing sharing the love of Jesus in the way he was at his own expense, taking people out for coffees and, and just being Christ Jesus to people who probably never saw anybody else as Christ Jesus. And I still had the odd disagreement with this gentleman because we had different personalities, but I loved that man. And, and like I said, I hope he's still alive and I hope he's still sharing the love of Jesus in the streets of Rockhampton. Yes, I do know for sure that when that gentleman reaches heaven, he is going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And I realised, what am I going to hear? So I had to, <laughs> I had to change my attitude to that gentleman. <clears throat> when we love each other, we keep no record of wrongs. Well, we're not supposed to keep a record of wrongs. We're all going to feel wronged by people, whether it's our families, people around us in our workplace or the community, or unfortunately, even here in church. But Jesus forgave us everything. And what we did to him sent him to the cross, but he has forgiven us. And so that is the angle that we need to think of when we've got to forgive somebody, whether it be the seven times that 
the Apostle Peter hoped that there would be the limit he'd have to forgive someone, or whether it's the 70 times 7, the 490 times that Jesus suggested, and I suspect Jesus told him that, hoping that he would forget, not keep count of the amount of times he forgave any particular individual. But forgiveness is, is um, a weapon in the spiritual realms. We give things over to Christ Jesus, who he can do the, the ultimate job in restoring, restoring relationships, restoring what was, had been uh, wronged to us or to them. Our Lord Jesus Christ died in our place and died in the other person's place. And sometimes when we get to thinking about things that we feel we've been wronged in, we might even start to realise that the other person has reason to feel that they've been wronged as well and that um, they might need to find in their heart God's grace to forgive us. Now Matthew chapter 7 verse 12 says, So in everything do to others what you would have them do to you. For well, this sums up the law and the prophets. Now, there's another one that said this sums up the law and the prophets, and that was when Jesus said, Love one another as I have loved you, and for this fulfills the law and the prophets. So to do unto others what we would have them do to us is another way of saying love one another. But we need to hear things from different angles so that we can take it in and and, um, and grasp it properly. So we need to ask ourselves in situations, how would I like to be treated? Or how would I like to be loved? Here's one for the blokes. We're driving along down the highway at 110 kilometers an hour because that's the speed limit. We're doing 110 on the dot. And next thing, there's a car comes past us, he overtakes us, he, he goes over the double white line to get past before the, the dotted line even starts, and he disappears off into the distance, and it's like, geez, I hope the cops are waiting for you. <laughs> well, half an hour up the road, we find that this man's pulled over, and he's waving, he's trying to get our attention to pull us over because he's got a very flat tyre. Well, for me, my natural instinct would be to wave and laugh and say, serves you right as I'm beeping the horn on the way past. But the Holy Spirit comes into play here and, and whispers in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. And so the conviction comes to pull over and stop and lend a hand. Well, guess what? Most likely the Holy Spirit is going to give us an opportunity to share the gospel with that man or with the people in his car. Now, if you were at Alan Lawrence level, you would have skipped altogether the thoughts of um, this guy deserving what he got. And we'd be going, hallelujah, praise the Lord, I've got somebody to share the gospel with. Now, that is what we should all be like, and I'm still growing in that area. <laughs> praise the Lord for people like Alan Lawrence. So Jesus' new command, as I have loved you, so you must love one another, it comes with the supercharged power of the Holy Spirit to transform us and fill us with Jesus' own genuine love, one for another. Now, what did Jesus change for the world as a whole? We've just had a scratch at the surface of what it means for us as individuals to be empowered by the Holy Spirit to obey Jesus' command to love one another. But let's take a little bit of a look now at what that means for the whole world. What can loving each other do for the whole world? Well, if we go back in history to the start of the fledgling church, we find that they conquered the Roman Empire, the rulers of the, known, in the whole known entire world. The fledgling church that had been so persecuted, they overtook, they overcame the Roman Empire. So to, before we go into that, we'll go back just a little bit further to uh, Daniel. The prophet Daniel, several hundred years earlier, tells us we're told a story of uh, Daniel interpreting a dream for King Nebuchadnezzar that King Nebuchadnezzar couldn't even remember the dream when he woke up in the morning. He just knew that it had been an incredibly important dream. And so Daniel was the only one in the whole of the land 
who was able to in, uh, not only interpret the dream, but to tell the king what the dream had been in the first place. So I'm going to read a little bit of a mishmash from Daniel chapter 2, verses 31 through to 45. <clears throat> so yes, at this point in history, uh, all of the kingdom of Israel is captive, or the kingdom of Judah, I should say, the southern kingdom. They're captive in Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar and his army have um, been and destroyed Jerusalem and carried off the, the people of Judah into captivity in Babylon. And so in this scenario is when uh, Daniel provides this interpretation. And the dream was an, of an enormous statue with a head of gold, shoulders and chest of silver, torso of bronze, legs and feet of iron and clay, a peculiar mix. Each part of the statue represented an empire, with the last one, the legs and feet of iron and partly clay, that was the one that was of interest to us because history shows us that that was the Roman Empire. So as Daniel attempts to, well, as, sorry, he didn't attempt, he did. So as Daniel interprets the dream, he starts out, you, Nebuchadnezzar, are that head of gold. After you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom, yet it will have some, some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw the iron mixed with the clay. While you were watching, a rock was cut out, but not by human hands. It struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and gold were all broken into pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor in the summer. The wind swept them away without leaving a trace. But the rock that struck the statue became a huge mountain that filled the whole earth. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by he human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver and the gold to pieces. So history records that the Babylonian Empire was, in, was overpowered by the brute force of the invading Mede and Persian Empire, who in turn were overpowered by the lightning speed and the size of the army of Alexander the Greek, uh, Alexander the Great, and his uh, his Greek Empire, and that in turn was overpowered by the all-conquering Roman army and their empire. So how on earth did the fledgling church of our Lord Jesus Christ overpower the might and the glorious power of the Roman army? Well, how does an ant eat an elephant? <laughs> One bite at a time. Yes. So in the case of the church overcoming the Roman Empire, it was one convert at a time. One Christian sharing with other people around them and converting them to the love of our Lord Jesus Christ with the gospel that has power. So as the church faced massive persecution in Jerusalem and Israel, Christians spread out into other countries. They took the gospel of Jesus with them and they shared the good news of Christ Jesus with everyone who would listen wherever they went. And they went throughout the whole of the known earth. And so in the end, the, the Roman Empire, which had become so uh, anti-Christian, persecuting Christians and killing Christians, they became a Christian empire in the end. So the fledgling church overcame the might and the power of the Roman Empire with the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. It was, and it still is, the most effective network marketing scheme ever devised 
And that's because it came directly from God, from our Lord Jesus Christ. Most pyramid schemes fall apart because there's not enough money or wealth to go around once too many people have joined. But since it was God that started this scheme, there's always enough to go around because in God's kingdom, there is abundance. So in conclusion, I'd like to imagine that if we all lived our lives knowing that this same power was at work in us and through us, and we weren't just wondering if it was possible or half hoping that it might be possible, but we actually expect and believe for those same results as the early church saw in taking over the entire uh, Roman Empire. How about we can imagine that one person at a time we can make a difference in Blackall, we can make a difference in central Queensland, in the state of Queensland and in Australia. One person at a time. We don't have to be Billy Graham speaking to 75,000 people at a time and having thousands of people give their lives to Christ Jesus at a time. We give thanks to our Lord Jesus Christ that the people such as, as Billy Graham and, and those evangelists do exist and that they can and they do lead thousands to Christ. But each one of us is empowered by the love of Christ Jesus to share the gospel one person at a time to show the love of Christ Jesus to those around us. And that creates an unstoppable avalanche. That avalanche effect has been going since Christ Jesus rose from the dead. And as an avalanche gains strength as it falls down the side of a mountain, bringing more and more rocks and trees and everything else with it, so that the same thing has been happening with the Christian church since Christ Jesus rose again. We've gone from... Uh, 120 people in an upper room or something like that to 3,000 people converted within a few days. We read so shortly after that in Acts that there was 5,000 people. So we've gone to now today having millions, probably billions of people who believe in our Lord Jesus Christ in this world. Now, when we look around us, we sometimes see that it looks a bit gloomy and there's, there's bad stuff happening we don't agree with everything our governments are doing and it kind of looks like there might be storm clouds brewing. However, our Western um, world, our Western civilization is only a small part of the world as a whole. And there are amazing things happening in other parts of the world. Former, former communist and dictatorship countries have turned wholeheartedly to our Lord Jesus Christ and so we will, we, we will believe that our own land, Australia, the UK, America, Europe, will once again turn back to Christ Jesus. And that will happen as you and I share the love of Christ Jesus with those around us, one person at a time. The power of our Lord Jesus Christ is released. And it was Jesus who said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now, I used the picture of an avalanche because I felt it helped to convey the unstoppable power and the gathering momentum that, uh, that, that happens with the church and with uh, people sharing the love of Christ to those around them. But in Daniel's vision, he used the picture of a rock. It was a rock that was cut out um, without human hands that rock that crushed the Roman Empire, the feet and the, the legs of clay and iron, that rock grew and became a mountain that filled the whole earth. So we are part of that process of fulfilling Daniel's dream that the church of our Lord Jesus Christ, that empire that will never end, will never, um, never be overthrown, that empire is growing and we are part of it. Yes, that, that empire, the kingdom of God, it will never be destroyed and it will last forever. Father, I thank you that you have given us the privilege of being part of building your kingdom. But I thank you that it is your power that is behind this. As you said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades 
shall not prevail against it. I thank you that we are on the winning side. I thank you that Christ Jesus, once and for all, won the victory over sin, over Satan, and over death. I thank you that death no longer holds any fear for us. I thank you that there is nothing that men can do to us <coughs> that will affect our eternal salvation. I thank you for heaven that waits for, for us. I thank you that there are people that you have put in our paths to love, to share the gospel of Christ with. Father, would you fill us? Fill us again with your Holy Spirit. Empower us, I pray, to live holy lives and to be your witnesses in Blackall and to the ends of the world, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen.